Okay. Good morning, everybody. And I guess good morning, majority offline, or online rather, later on. Um, so today we're going to do dynamic programming. Um, so last week we looked briefly at directed graphical models, and I guess we managed to solve reasonably well who came first, the chicken and the egg, and while well, unfortunately I forgot to wear my suitable t-shirt for that, I hope I can make up for that today. And the short summary of who came first, the chicken and the egg, is, well, it's the wrong question to ask because the chicken doesn't lay its own egg, right? So you basically have a causal chain with time in it, and with the existing tools of graphical models, we can now actually write this all in plate notation, right? So here's how the chicken and egg dilemma happens in plate notation. So first we, let's say, have the chicken. It doesn't really matter, so chicken I. And that lays an egg, EI. And now what happens is, okay, we have many of them, so here's our plate. And the key ingredient is that the chicken and the egg don't refer to themselves, but they refer to the outside and are affected from the outside. Sometimes for additional clarity, just in case this isn't really blatantly clear, you could do things like you would draw a CI plus one here. So this way, it's completely clear that chicken I doesn't lay its own egg. And then you have the index variable i. What it doesn't do is, it doesn't actually address how you start that entire chain. So we are back to the old philosopher's dilemma, but we're not going to solve that here today. But at least you can see that asking the question who came first, the chicken and the egg, is a stupid question to ask because it misses important detail about the internal state of the system. OK. so. The obvious question now is, how do we actually solve such a chicken coop? After all, you know, this is a chain of random variables. And each of those random variables could be a 0 and 1. Right? So if there's only one chicken at any time and only one egg at any time, well, that's kind of trivial, right? Because we know immediately if the egg gets crushed, no more chicken, right? So that dynamic program is very, very simple to solve because it would have to be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 until at some point it's pancake or chicken roast. And after that, it's all zero. OK. Um, that's a very simple case. So what I just gave you, joking aside, is a simple case of a Markov model where dynamic programming is actually a stupid idea to solve it with. Now you might wonder, well, does, do that, such things exist? Yes. So there's a very simple model, the skip, view, click model, for instance, for how to model how people consume content from search results. And that model is basically, well, the user keeps on reading the stuff it, until at some point he gets bored and frustrated and then switches to a different search engine or, well, watches the cat movie. And that's exactly one of those models where we have actually latent variables, namely, do we know whether the user watched it or not? where dynamic programming, well, you could do it, but it would actually make the algorithm more messy to implement than just a simple sequence. OK. So those very simple models are still quite powerful and actually let you do all sorts of interesting things. Um, but we're going to do the dynamic programming now. So just as, a, as an advanced warning, Dynamic programming is often the solution, but not always. Sometimes there are easier solutions. Okay. So we'll be talking about chains and trees. And well, let's start with chains. So now we don't have just a, well, chicken or no chicken scenario, but we just have some binary random variable, let's say 0, 1. And I have a transition to the next binary random variable. So xi goes to xi plus 1. And I have some transition matrices. And they can be whatever I want them to be. Let's say, for instance, from 2 to 3, which is this transition here, I just invert the bit. 
And from one to two, well, I mostly stay the same, but I will mostly transition into ones and so on. So quick explanation of what those diagrams actually mean. This is basically, I'm starting with a zero. Well, I'm starting with a zero. What will I end up with? I'm starting with a one. What will I end up with? Here I'm starting. What will I end up with? All right. So that's basically the corresponding conditional probability table. So you can clearly see that the columns have to sum up to 1. The rows don't. Right? So can somebody tell me why the columns have to sum up to 1? Well, it's basically I have to transition into something, right? So the sum over all the possible transitions has to sum up to 1 because the probability, sum over all the partial probabilities have to be 1. OK, good. Um, the rows don't have to sum up to 1 because, well, these are essentially, for all practical purposes, different distributions. They have nothing to do with each other. I just so happen to write them in matrix form. That will actually make my math a lot easier later on. But other than that, they just happen to, well, live on the same slide. Now. Let's do the first thing. Let's actually work out what p of x1 is, uh, not given x0. Well, that one we already know. That's basically this object here. But what's p of x1? Well, it's basically the sum over all possible values of x0. p of x0 times, well, p of x1 given x0. So I have, in order to know, you know what the probability of x1 equals 1 is, I have to sum over all the possible cases that x0 can assume times the transition probabilities for x0 into x1 equals 1. Now, you've definitely seen this thing before. It's a matrix vector product. Right? Right, so this is a vector, this is a matrix, and I'm just reading off the first, well, or the second row of that matrix vector product. So what I get is that pi 1 is pi 0, 1, times pi 0. That's pi 0, 1. That's pi 0. For x2, well, I can just follow the same recursion. And I get that this is another transition matrix times pi 1. But I knew that this was already that one times pi 0. So we now have the product of two matrices. Okay. So that's kind of nice, right? And by just induction of, while well, looking from special case to general, we can see that if I have a longer chain, all I have to do is just I have to multiply those matrices together, which is something that MATLAB actually likes to do a lot. So let's see how that code looks like in, well, MATLAB or Python. So, so I start with, you know, x0 being and all the various transition matrices being whatever I might want to make them to do. Right. So now, this is my super advanced Python program, and that's what it'll spit out. Okay. So it's very very easy to do this in on a computer. And if you had to do that by hand, it would be supremely awkward. Um, does somebody have an idea what the largest singular value of those transition matrices could be? Yes? OK, that's great. So why would they have to, why can it not be larger than 1? So the answer is correct, but why? Yeah, you're on the right track. Um, if the probabilities were normalized to 5, then you would still get the normalization with 1. So you're close to the correct answer. So, so here's what happens, right? So suppose I have, one of, I have those transition matrices, and I keep on transitioning over and over, right? Then in aggregate, my total probability mass is finite and it's always one. So if I start with a normalized system, it will not, never become unnormalized. The net result of that is that if I just 
raise that matrix to a higher power, you will you must not get a product that is divergent, right? So you must not get something that where the you know basically the, the left hand left hand side result becomes infinity, right? Because that would just mean that you know your probabilities become infinite. That's not good. Likewise, you must not have a situation where the probabilities vanish and nothing happens anymore. Basically, you need to conserve probability. So therefore, you, know, you must get a situation where the largest eigenvalue is exact, or singular value is exactly one. Okay. So that's the only constraint that we have to impose on those matrices. Okay. Um, so, and this is a very, very useful property. So, for instance, if you have this, quite often you will then ask the question, well, okay, so now we know the largest eigenvalue or singular value because by construction, how large is the second largest one? And this gap between the largest and the second largest singular value <coughs> tells me how rapidly certain transition processes actually converge. Because if the, let's make a simple case, Let's say, you know, okay, so we have lambda 1 equals 1. Let's say lambda 2 equals 1 half. In that case, if I have, you know, 10 of those matrices concatenated, well, the second largest eigenvalue will now be lambda 2 raised to the power 10. So in other words, it'll be 10 to the minus 3. And at that point, it basically means that my transition process for all practical purposes has converged, and whatever I start out with, I will end up with a stationary distribution. Um, stuff like this matters, for instance, when you look at algorithms like PageRank. Who's heard of PageRank before? Okay, good. Uh, big disclaimer. Page rank is a useful quantity, but this is not how people rank web pages on the internet. So don't ever go and write a paper which says, we do page rank because this is the applied algorithm how people rank pages on the internet. That was the case maybe when Google was started ages ago, uh, but this is not how now people use page rank. It's a useful feature among probably many, many, many other features. So don't think you can do web page ranking by computing page rank. Well, regardless, what page rank is is this transition process where you basically, at any time, with a given probability, you just randomly restart, or alternatively, you follow a link. So you can write this as a transition matrix, where the transition matrix is basically our graph matrix G. We have to normalize by one over the degree And then you actually take a convex combination of this, 1 minus alpha this, plus alpha times the identity. Okay. Alpha is here the random restart probability. G is the graph connectivity. It's basically zeros when you don't have an edge, and 1 when you have a link that you can follow. So it's a directed graph. And that's our transition matrix pi. And the page rank is the stationary vector under that matrix. OK. So I hope that helps a little bit explain how very, very simple applications of such Markov chains work. Now, of course, we're not going to content ourselves only with first order chains. That would be too boring. We can do second order chains. So second order chains are just that. They basically have transitions that not only depend on the previous state, but on the two previous states. And so obviously a third order chain is one that depends on the previous three states, and so on and so on. Okay. Quick question. Can I transform a second order chain into a first order chain? Yes? How would you do it? Exactly. So the trick 
on how to turn this, this into that is very easy. Basically, I go and you know, define a new state. Let's call it zi to be xi and xi minus 1. And then I just have a transition probability which is now a little bit more subtle, namely it, it is one where going from zi to zi plus 1, the first and the second argument get swapped and the other one gets a new transition. But other than that, I can do this. So physicists actually have a name for this. This is called moving into phase space. So basically when you describe a particle, you would describe it not necessarily only by its location, but also by its location, its velo velocity. And you can essentially approximate the velocity by the state right now and the state of fraction of a millisecond before, right? That's exactly something where you turn a second order Markov system, namely the flight of this uh, pin, into a first order Markov system now with a larger state. Actually, with, if I was to throw that pen at you, you would probably need a slightly higher dimensional state space because you would also need to look at acceleration, right? So that would be the equivalent of a third order Markov model. And so if I describe the particle by location, previous location, and previous, previous location, that will give you an accurate information about what's going on. Right? So this is essentially classical mechanics as a Markov chain. And, well, here's the math to it, right? It's very simple. And, yeah, okay. Plug to a colleague of mine. Um, here's the math, really. Okay, so here we have, you know, P of X parameterized by theta is P of X naught given theta times the product of P of Xi plus 1 given Xi. And, well, there is the simple plate notation. So if I do some statistical modeling and I talk to somebody who actually wants to use this, I would probably use this language. This is what you do if you implement it. Okay, so let's actually work out what happens. So P of Xi, so this is basically again working out the matrix recursion, right? It's basically P of X naught times all these products before and the sum here. And we're going up to term Xi, but then we also have Xi plus 1 to Xn. And that's kind of a stupid thing to do because we don't really care about the children if we don't observe them. But later on, we are going to observe the children, and that recursion will actually be very useful. Okay. So what I can do is I can go and actually, well, let me just define this to be L0 of X0. It's basically the lift message going from the lift through the chain. It's that times P of X1 given X0. So this is what we before had in matrix notation. I'm just going to rename things. And this is now L1 of X1. Right, so this is basically what I get by summing over X0. And then I can push this further. And what you will see is that now you have the same recursion again for L2. So in other words, what we get is that we have some initial message L, L0, we can compute L1 from X L0 by doing this very simple sum that's in this red bar here. And then we get L2 and so on. The reason why we could do this is because basically like an onion, we peel off the individual sums here. So we first peel off X0, because there's only one term really that sits in there. Then we peel off X1, which is what we get here. Then we get x2, and we keep on going. So, yes? These are observations, right? Um, they may be observed. Well, if they're observed, I don't really need to sum over them, uh, because then I already know what their values are. Uh, if I don't observe them, yes, I need to integrate them out, which is exactly what I'm doing here. 
So basically, what we are just working our way towards is the forward-backwards algorithm for inferencing you know, graphical models. So this is a very, very gentle warm-up for dynamic programming. And afterwards, we will go and actually replace the sums and products with general operations that behave like sums and products. And we will not only look at chains, but we'll look at trees. We will actually have larger state spaces that we're going to sum through. So this is really the bare bones of what we're going to do in the next hour or so. And yeah, so I know this is very, very, very basic. But what I want to show you is that the concepts are very simple. And that afterwards, all we do is we just overload the notation. And then you can actually get highly non-trivial algorithms. At least non-trivial, unless you know where they came from. OK. OK, so now the point is, for directed graphs, we don't really need this uh, because they are normalized. But it's good to know. However, now let's assume that we are exactly in that situation where you observe x3. So now the horrible of horrible things happens. Namely, now, since we observed the very child at the very end of that chain, I cannot just go and say everything is properly normalized anymore, because now I'm conditioning on, it, on x3. So I actually need to sum over all the other variables before. But you know, not to worry. The dynamic programming uh, algorithms, well, basically the operations from the left-hand side, stay exactly the same as before. Right? And so we can sum over all those variables, keep on summing over everything, until at some point we are basically stuck with, you know, p of x3 given, you know, x2. And this is now going to, since we observe x3, this is basically now going to be our write message in x3, well, in x2, actually. And we could basically perform the entire summation also from the right. So just in the same way as we could peel off things from the beginning of the chain, we can peel things off from the end of the chain. So there we go. That's basically our write message. And that's the previous write message. So what happens is that we are basically computing left messages going from the left to the right, right messages coming in from the right. Those things do not necessarily have to be properly normalized anymore. Actually, it doesn't really matter whether they are or not. Because in the end, all I do is I just go and divide by them. Because if you think about it, if we want to get, let's say, for instance, p of x1 given x3, Okay, so let's say p of x1 given x3. That means that I have to sum over x0, and I also have to sum over x2 of that entire chain. Right. And now, to sum over anything up to x1, I can just you know, work my way through the left messages. And likewise, I can work all my way to the right messages until I end up with a function that depends only on x1. And so I will get basically L1 of x1 times uh, R1 of x1. OK. And so now, I basically have something where I've completely summed out anything but x1. And now it's trivial for me to normalize. This is what allows me to compute p of x1 given the rest. So this is fairly crucial here. And I really want to make sure you guys understand that part, because we're going to be using it over and over. So any questions right now are probably, now is a good time to ask questions, I guess. <laughs>
if you're not sure. Okay. Any questions? So we will we will give an, we will go through an example uh, in yeah basically one or two slides. Uh, so we'll do that for binary random variables. But I first want to make sure we everybody sort of kind of is clear on the concept. We'll see that same. Yep. The, yeah. So you could implement it with a recursion, but you'd basically have to implement a forward recursion and a backwards recursion as separate algorithms. So basically what you would end up with two different pieces of code for the forward and the backwards pass. What I'm going to show you afterwards is how you can use the same piece of code for all of that. Yes? Um, the summation, those uh, circled red indices, it goes from x, n minus 1, to x, n minus 1, x, n minus 2. It shouldn't be x, n minus 1, x, n minus 2, x, n minus 3. Um, well, it should be, um, well, basically, it, yeah, basically, at every step, you peel off one sum in the end. Yes. So. Okay, that's, that's right, because all, all you've done going from the first line to the second line is just write that one factor okay. yes. separately. Yes. So if you are on a Mac, you will actually be able to use just the keynote, and you can extract the, yeah, basically the LaTeX from it in case you want to know the exact indices. But um, I mean, it's probably a little bit hard to see from the back. But basically, all you're doing is you're summing out over one variable at a time. And the reason why I can sum out over the last one is because it doesn't affect anything else going further. Right? So that's the main reason why you can actually uh, perform the sum rather than summing somewhere in the middle. Because if I was to sum out over something in the middle, it would actually affect the variable to the left and to the right. Um, you have probably encountered that in the past. Who has worked with sparse matrices before? OK. Uh, do you guys know what dense fill-in is? OK, dense fill-in is basically the horrible thing that happens if you solve for one of the variables, and all of a sudden, your beautiful sparse matrix becomes dense. This is exactly equivalent to what happens in a Gaussian graphical model, basically where we have that chain, but now with normal distributions, where all of a sudden, by integrating out one variable, the rest of the covariance matrix becomes dense. Um, so there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between a lot of algorithms in numerical linear algebra and what you're doing in graphical models, which is kind of nice because you can import a lot of ideas. OK, so let's just look at the entire thing. Formally, <clears throat> what we basically had is we had the left message, which is basically li of xi, which is given by, well, taking the previous left message, multiplying it by p of xi given xi minus 1 and summing over xi minus 1, and doing the same thing from the right. Well, you basically start actually with the right message being 1. Or if you observe something, then you would make this the corresponding you know, conditional probability. And you then keep on summing back. OK. And so marginalization and conditioning, well, p of xi is just you know, left and right sum. That's straightforward. And conditioning is just well, by, you know, dividing by the suitable terms. So this is fairly straightforward. OK. Now, let's look at that in a message passing framework. And then we're going to go and look at a very specific example. So think of this graphical model as a graph on which you're sending messages from one vertex to the next. 
So imagine maybe you have a small processor that sits on each of those vertices, and what it can do is it can talk to its neighbors. So for instance, if you use GraphLab, so this is a very nice uh, distributed you know, inference toolkit for graphical models. It does a whole bunch of other things too, but it's really unbeatable for that part. Um, then what you would do is you would basically write exactly what it means to send messages from one vertex to another. And what happens here is that you know, the forward message is very simple. You just you know, take the previous message, multiply it by some score, and you sum over the, free, over the current variable. And the backward message looks exactly the same. So that should already give you an indication that maybe you can write a piece of code which doesn't really care whether we're going from left to right or right to left, provided that I supply it with those messages and the corresponding function f. OK. So this was maybe now super abstract. Let's look at the simple case. Let's say, well, there's maybe a 50% probability that I will you know, have lunch at Tatsudoro, and maybe that I will brown bag my own lunch. And because, well, Tatsudoro is so amazingly delicious, if I went to Tatsudoro, then there's a 90% chance that I will stay at, go back to Tatsudoro next time, and a 10% chance that, well, maybe I'll brown bag. On the other hand, if I brown bag, maybe I'm not such a good cook, then there's only an 80% chance that I'll eat my own food the next day again, and a 20% chance that I'll go to Tatsadoro. OK. So, and let's assume that basically my cooking skills don't really change over the days, and that the quality of Tatsadoro food is essentially unchanged, which I think is a pretty good assumption. Tastes the same every day. Um, so, now let's assume that on the fifth day, somebody observes me as you know, having been at Tatsadoro. And we know the initial probability of, you know, one half each. And now what you want to do is you want to infer from having seen me on the fifth day at Tatsadoro what the, what the probability was that I would have gone to Tatsadoro on the third day. So what basically happens is now that we have some information about the beginning of the chain, we have an observation about what happens at the very end. And we're going to try and use that to infer what happens in the middle. Right? So what we are basically going to do in order to, to get this is we'll need to, OK, first actually you know, write out our, our messages, sorry, our transition probabilities. These are the same throughout, and also our initial state. So. That's the transition probability, that's the initial state. So that gives me, by just performing the left message propagation, so I'm doing two steps here, and this is very simple, it's matrix multiplication. And I get, you know, the left message at time, time step three. Okay, so at time step three, well, you can see that I end up gravitating more towards Tatsudoro. But it's not very conclusive. Because while well, you know, the within state transition probabilities, those are fairly high. Now, on the other hand, I observe that at the last day, I am actually a Tatsadoro. So I have to vector 1, 0. And now, what I have to do is I have to do the messages going from the right. So these were the left messages. These are the right messages. So now I basically transition from state 5 to 4, 4 to 3. So I get R3. And this is basically, so to say, the likelihood that I would have been in state 1, as in Tatsudoro at the end, for the corresponding initial states. And now what I need to do is I need to actually pointwise multiply these and normalize. 
Right, because I have left message and right message combined. And then, after I normalize, I get these as my corresponding probabilities. So what you can see is it's about 77% that I will have been at Hatsadoro on day three. Compared to, well, about 59% if I didn't observe the last state. So this is about as simple a Markov chain as you can design it because it only has two states and it has a stationary transition probability. So stationary basically means that this, these transition matrices, namely this one here, doesn't change over time. So if Tatsadoro, for instance, was to change its food every day, and if, for instance, what I eat depends on whether I cook or whether my wife cooks, then um, this matrix all of a sudden would not be stationary anymore. So, for instance, you might get something like this if my wife cooks. Or maybe you get something like this on maybe a Monday if they have stale food. Right? So, what would happen is that you would basically have different matrices that you chain together. The algorithm would remain exactly the same, except that, well, now you have a non-stationary Markov chain. Okay. Any questions here about Tatsadoro? Can you write out like the equivalent probability of Ri? I mean, the, the general case. So, well, the general thing is what we had on the previous slide. Doing the explicit matrix multiplication here, I think my font size is not large enough for that. No, no I mean, but just, just the general thing, the, the probability of Ri. Well, so the, well, the right message is, well, basically just multiplying the transition matrices transposed, right? So this is exactly what we had here before. Right? This is the right message. This is basically, you know, P of xi plus 1 given xi. And this is my corresponding right message, R of xi plus 1. All right. So, yeah. That is what you have in general. Well, the meaning of Ri is basically the sum of all the states on f starting from the end of the chain up to position i. And so if I want to advance and go back one further step, I need to sum over that state as well. So I have the message up to here. I multiply it with the transitions that I have between state i and state i minus 1. And I sum over R I, over state i. So one thing that I would strongly encourage you to do, because if you've never seen this before, it's probably, well, quite a bit of work. Sit down afterwards and work through this on your own. There's only so much I can do by showing you the overall algorithm. You actually need to do it once by yourself. Well, you'll probably need to do it five to ten times by yourself until you are really, really confident at it. There's just no other way. I mean, you, you'll have to practice. Right? It's, it's one thing if you just you know, look at those equations, but it, it's, yeah, it's, it requires a little bit of practice and thinking through. I mean, the homework will probably go a little bit in that direction, but Now, if we have a tree, well, the same thing happens there as well, except that now we have to worry about a couple of things. So the big problem is essentially, you know, what happens here? Here, this message, that's all fine, up to here. But now we basically have, you know, x3 and x6 depending on x2. 
So let's just actually you know, go through it and see what happens. So the lift, first lift message is straightforward, right? That's just you know, L1 of x1 is p of x0 times p of x1 given x0, and I sum over x0. Likewise, the first write message is also fairly straightforward. So, you know, it's just this term here. Okay, the next one is also completely straightforward. So this is really just following exactly the reasoning that we did before. Okay, now let's do this one here. So the, the message R2 of x2, which basically goes from x6 to x2, is also straightforward. No, we just follow the iteration. However, now things get a little bit different. We need to basically work out what the message 2x3 is. Right? So the issue is basically that in order to figure out what happens to x3, we need to know what happened to x6 and to x1. So the, all the information gets channeled into x2, with, as shown by those red arrows. And so now we need to figure out what happens here. It's actually kind of straightforward. What you do is you basically take the product over all the incoming messages from basically all the other edges besides the one that we had before. Note that those directions of the edges have nothing to do with the directions of the edges in our graphical model from before. So we will basically have messages going either way in a graphical model, whether it's directed or undirected. So afterwards, we'll see undirected mo graphical models, and they behave exactly the same way, just that they have slightly different meanings. And again, you do exactly the same message passing and all that. And so now, in order to deal with x3, what we have to do is we basically have to integrate out all the influences from x2. Now we have basically two, two incoming messages into x2, so L2 and R2. We have P of x3 given x2. OK, so this is exactly what we had here. And then I just sum over all the x2s and I'm done. OK, and then I just keep on going. So the special rule that we saw here that will also hold in general is take all the incoming messages besides the one where you want to get the outcoming, outgoing message to, multiply them with the appropriate click potential, and then send the message out. OK, so this was quite a conceptual jump from what we had before, except that here the model still is fairly simple. Yes? So in this, um, given the initial probabilities and having observed x8, you're trying to infer x5? For instance, okay. yes. So you're absolutely right. What I really would have had to do is maybe shade this guy here. Yeah, because otherwise this entire thing integrates out to 1, right? I mean, I could run the algorithm, but I would just get you know, vectors of 1 uh, all throughout, which would be kind of useless. So you're absolutely right. And so I could, for instance, ask something like, you know, what's p of x5 given x8? And since they have a common parent, well, we actually need to you know, take that into account. Or you could, for instance, have you know, x0 being observed. By the way, if you observe x1, then, of course, you can start the, the recursion directly at x1, right? Well, or x2, rather. This is exactly what we had from last Wednesday when we looked at dependence. So when you cannot send a message through with a baseball algorithm, remember our transition rules, you can just cut that part off. 
So that's why you want to be able to programmatically understand those rules, such that given a graphical model, given the conditioning that you do, you can actually throw out stuff that you don't care about and then run this dynamic program afterwards. So the good thing is, while this is messy for humans, you only have to code up the rule once and then your algorithm will happily actually solve this. Okay. So here's the general thing. And this is the one picture you absolutely should remember. This is the template for the so-called junction tree algorithm. And afterwards, what sits in here will become a little bit more complicated. But it's actually a very, very simple idea. Messages going into two are all multiplied. Then multiplied by a potential that couples you know, two and three. And then you integrate out over this variable of that vertex. So you basically multiply and sum. This is why it's sometimes called the sum product algorithm. Because you sum and you multiply. Okay. If I had, you know, four variables here, right? So I could you know, draw another one. Then I would simply have to multiply times m5 2 of x2. And the algorithm would not change. Now the thing is, you do this for this combination, but then you can also do it for a message going from 2 to 1, or from 2 to 4. So this is the other good thing that I only really need to ever compute messages going from one vertex to its neighbor and in the reverse direction to be able to answer all questions that I might want to ask about that graphical model. So for instance, if I wanted to get all the marginal probabilities on a chain, I would basically compute all the forward messages. I would go and compute all the backward messages. And then for any given variable, all I'd have to do is just take its appropriate forward and its appropriate backward message, multiply and renormalize. Okay. So the other thing that you've probably already seen from this is that the algorithm, in terms of the operations, is basically linear in the number of edges. Right, because for each edge I need to compute two messages, that's it. If you want to be a bit more pedantic and if you don't implement it efficiently, you could say, well, yeah, it's the number of edges plus number of all the neighbors, but you can actually sometimes cache those results. Yes? What's the relation between those messages and what? Uh, like, um, I worked in dynamic vision and we can, like, we have beliefs about this state. Oh, beliefs. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So these are the beliefs. Yes. So sometimes this is also called belief propagation. So if you think about it, what happened in the case of, you know, Lanche Tazadoro is I have a prior belief of Alex going to Tazadoro. And I have a basically a, you know, based on the evidence, posterior belief of Alex having be, been at Tatsadoro at some point. And then I need to reconcile prior with, well, actually with likelihood, re really, and that's what gives me these things. Yeah, what, what I found confusing was the metaphor of all these messages and what, whatever beliefs and didn't really spell out to, you know, plain probability. Well, how did that normalization happen? Mm. So, okay, so here's the thing. There are a lot of other cases where I don't have probabilities. So, for instance, I might want to compute the most likely annotation. So, shortest path type of algorithms follow exactly the same rule. So, this is why I try to explain it in a slightly more abstract manner, because besides the 
some product algorithm, there's also the min plus algorithm. There's also the set union in, in, in an intersection algorithm and a whole bunch of others. They all follow exactly the same template. And that's the case because they all have a corresponding distributive semi-ring. And so there's a paper called the Generalized Distributive Law, which spells out all those connections very nicely. It's quite a famous paper in the IEEE information theory. I think it was published about almost 15 years ago. And that really clarified how a lot of those algorithms, essentially divide and conquer style algorithms, worked. For instance, if you think about the Fourier transform, it again uses the distributive law. So distributivity and associativity of multiplication and addition to, do the F to implement the FFT very efficiently. This is another example of the family of algorithms that we've been going through right now. And so rather than FFT, you can think of other operations that you could do in its place, and you would get other fast transforms. Right. So as said, this is the very basic template. We are now going to use this over and over. Okay. So in the case of trees, well, this is just what we have before. Right? And you can look at other messages where you have maybe a message from 2 to 6. And yeah, same thing. So you basically need to compute three different messages here. Well, you don't always have to compute all three. But if you wanted to do inference for the entire graphical model for any possible random variable, then yes, you would need all those messages. Now, why do we care? Well, you know, those chains are kind of stupid and simple. Because sometimes I don't always observe the hidden chain or the hidden tree. But I have some observations there. So here's a simple example of that. Suppose I want to track an aircraft. right? And what I do is I don't really observe where the aircraft is, but I just see where the radar bounces off the aircraft. This is a very important problem if you want to, for instance, make sure that planes don't crash into each other. So since you can only see you know, the radar bouncing off, this gives you some idea of where the aircraft could have been given that single observation. Or more to the point, you will usually have a pretty good model of what the radar signature looks like for a given hidden state x. So you basically have that forward model of p of radar, so p of z, given plane state x. We also have some idea of how planes move, because they usually fly in a straight line, and they usually will fly at the same speed, and so on. Um, so basically, we have an interesting transition model from xi to xi plus 1, which is basically most of the time the planes don't do anything particular, and they will just go straight. And their speed doesn't change very much and all that. Okay. Um, now, OK, so I'm not quite sure how to explain that part uh, with, of the branching off uh, with airplanes, unless I'm, for instance, Virgin Atlantic or Galactic or whatever it is, and they at some point have a rocket that flies off to space and the carrier goes down. So that might happen at position x2. And now I have to track two radar signatures, right? Or you have a fighter jet shooting off a missile if you want. But yeah, basically, you have a plane, and at some point, you have two pieces of that plane. You want to track them separately. And of course, knowing this and that trajectory should help you something about figuring out when they separated and also where they were. But you only have the radar signatures. So. What in this case you need to do is, well, you need to actually write, first of all, the corresponding conditional probabilities. So p of x and z is just you know, p of x times p of z given x. So I'm assuming that subsequent radar blips are you know, independent of each other, and they really just depend on the state of where the plane was. 
And then furthermore, I have the transition probabilities. And I'm just going to write them as f of xi and xj. This is how the plane moves and how at some point it shoots off a rocket. Okay. And so now what I can do is I can just work out, you know, what's p of xi given the rest. And that's just summing over everything but that variable. And now I have this hairball of things. But the good thing is that now I can actually use message passing. I basically get that this is nothing else but g of xi, the observation at that point, let's say, times the product of all the messages that are incoming at that point. And now since things don't really trivially normalize up to 1 anymore, I actually need to work out all the messages. So for instance, this would allow you, with hindsight, to figure out what happened at x2, given all the radar traces in the past and in the uh, right? Basically, all the radar traces before and after the event. Okay. So this is now how we've gone from something very, very trivial, namely, well, just you know, working our way through a chain, to something that's highly non-trivial. Let me give you another example where something like this matters. So when you have a cell phone, your cell phone has often something that people refer to with various names, including Wi-Fi GPS. So in other words, when you pull out your cell phone indoors, if you do that now and open up Google Maps, for instance, you'll see that it will actually locate you fairly decently. Right? It might not exactly locate you to this room, but it'll do a pretty good job and figure out that you're at CMU. So the way how this works is actually based on a number of things. And that's the same, basically, if you use, uh, well, your iPhone. Um, essentially, it uses a number of sensors. First of all, it uses the cell tower information to give you a general information that, well, you're in Pittsburgh. Or maybe somewhere, you know, within one or two miles from the CMU campus. Secondly, it will actually use the information that there are various Wi-Fi beacons with corresponding SSIDs and signal strings to get some idea of where you are. Furthermore, it may or may not, and that depends on which phone you have and which operating system and stuff, um, use the fact that maybe here's the trajectory how you walked into this place, right? And of course, the holy grail is to use the GPS as little as possible and to use that kind of Wi-Fi information as much as possible because the Wi-Fi information is already free. Because most of the time you have Wi-Fi turned on anyway, so you already know where the base stations are. GPS takes quite a while to fire up. It takes about you know, 10, 20 milliseconds to fire up. It uses a lot of, a lot of power. So the more you can avoid firing up the GPS, the longer your phone lasts. So this is a practical example where you're going to use this to fill in details on a Markov chain. Any question? Uh, how do they know where the Wi-Fi signals are located geographically? That's a very good question. Um, so you can do a number of things. For instance, you could actually go, um, and at some point, let's say some phone actually had a GPS turned on at that location in the past. So let's assume you're outdoors. Then at some point we will observe a Wi-Fi signature and location mapping. You can then turn this around and turn it into a, well, if I'm there, then I'm going to see those base stations model, right? So you're basically going to turn around and turn this into exactly a P of Z given X model. So that's exactly that part. Right? P of Wi-Fi given location. And you basically treat the GPS as gold standard. Well, you shouldn't actually be doing this because otherwise people would be all Spider-Man cl and climbing up the, and down the walls of buildings. Because what happens is if you're in a room, then the line of sight to a satellite, well, okay, maybe not if you have you know, wooden walls, but if you have concrete walls in an office building, 
basically the GPS will always map you to exactly the outer surface of the building. And that's obviously not very meaningful, right? So you need to worry about details like this in practice. But besides that, you, you're basically going to use the Wi-Fi signature in combination with the GPS to map you. OK, now to go further, what you can actually do is you can do SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, to use inertial sensors to go, figure out where you are indoors. Probably about two years ago, Apple bought a company whose company name was Wi-Fi Slam. OK, so you can probably figure out what they're doing. And yes, I mean, other people also read that news. And yeah, I found out because at that time, I actually Google searched for Wi-Fi and Slam and uh, then found out that, yes, somebody had already done this. They did a pretty good job. Um, so this is a very short detour of how you can actually use hidden Markov models to locate people. Or, I mean, likewise, if you have a robot, I mean, it does the same thing. You basically have a transition model of how the robot drives around. You may have a map. You may not even have to map and are building up the map at the same time. And then you try to figure out where were you maybe five minutes ago. OK. So. Just to sum up a little bit, we basically you know, have a simple dynamic program. We go forwards and backwards. And yeah, it's a very simple idea. Okay, Junction trees, I want to actually get through this. We have to accelerate a little bit because I want us to cover neural networks and other things in the class before time runs out. Right. So if you think about it, I'm now going to complicate notation even further. So remember, we had the simple junction tree where we have basically f of x1, x2, f of x2, x3, and then you know x2, x4. And we had those messages. So now what I'm going to do is a slightly conceptual shift. I'm going to write everything in terms of cliques. Okay. A clique is a maximally connected subgraph. So basically, if I have a three clique, all the three vertices in that three clique are connected. And the set of cliques here is actually very simple to see. It's that one here. It's that one there. And that one there. And if you think about it, the, well, variables that we had were basically just, you know, something that happens conditioned on something else. So these were functions that coupled those two adjacent variables. And so now we have basically those three cliques, namely one, two. That's the red one here. Two, three, which was the yellow clique. And two, four, which was the green one here. And what I did is I cheated a little bit by writing this out as a chain. And I've written it out as a chain where the only variable that separates them is this 2. That's basically the only variable that's in common between those sets. So this graph has what is called a running intersection property. So running intersection property means that if an element occurs somewhere and in its neighbors, that basically all the twos must occur in a connected set. OK, so what I have, OK, so first of all, now in each vertex of that, in this case, simple chain, I draw sets. The first ver ver yeah, vertex contains the set with elements 1 and 2, next one, 2 and 3, the next one, 2 and 4. If I take intersections between the sets, in the first case, I get the variable 2. In the second case, I also get the variable 2. And what is called a running intersection property, 
is that <coughs> these separator sets, so that's basically what I'm calling these intersections, they must, OK, in this case, there's very little else I can do. But basically, this graph has a running intersection probably because there's the variable 2 occurring in both edges, and they are adjacent. So what shouldn't happen is that I get something like maybe I have a 2 here, and a 1 there, and a 2 there. That would not satisfy the running intersection property. OK. Um, so now let's actually see how this translates into message passing. Okay. So what we do is basically we take the click potentials and the messages are now messages that are parameterized on the variables in the intersection. So in this case, it was fairly easy because all the messages would contain x2. And that's exactly the case because, well, that's just what we had here. Now let's look at something a little bit bigger. OK. So here's a graph with you know, six variables. And now let's actually tease out the, well, uh, sorry. Yeah. So now let's, now let's tease out the cliques. So we have a clique that is 1, 2. Another clique that is 2, 4, 5. One that is 2, 3, 4. And one that's you know, 4, 5, 6. <clears throat> OK, these are all the cliques. You know, sub cliques don't really matter. We'll just write the entire click. OK. Now, again, we can look at the intersections. And so in the first case, it's just the variable 2. In the second case, it's 2 and 4. In the second case, it's 4 and 5. So this has the running intersection property because the 4, for instance, occurs here and there, and they are neighbors. 5 only occurs once. The 2 also occurs only for neighbors. Now, if I wanted to do message passing on this, I would basically have a message that goes, let's say, from 245 to 234. And it would depend on the variables x2 and x4. Here, this would depend on the variables x4 and x5. And this only on x2. And again, same thing as before. So the only difference is that now we've just overloaded the notation. The algorithm is still the same, just that, well, now it's rather much more powerful. This is why we went through these first examples in a fairly basic way. Now, the nice thing is that, as you noticed, I didn't draw any, any arrows here in, in the original graph. That for the purpose of inference, the arrows don't really matter for those undirected variables, except that in a, well, directed variable, directed edges, except that if I have edges, then this may sometimes allow me to cut off parts of the graph that I don't care about. This is the only point up to which I care about the direction for inference here. Now, obviously, some things can go wrong. So here's an example where something can go wrong. Here's a directed graphical model. And basically, I have some initial state 1, and that affects two chains. Let's say, for instance, x1, that's me. And, I, and what I do affects the left side and the right side of the room. And nobody talks to each other until the very end when basically maybe, I don't know, Somebody decides to you know, raise a, his arm and ask a question. right? So if we were to write the click graph, that's what we would get. 
Okay. And what you can already see here is that, well, this is not a tree. And so if I want to do message passing in that, this is not going to work. Because I will basically get circular effects. People do that anyway. This is called loopy belief propagation. So the technically wrong algorithm, which ignores the fact that you have loops and just runs message passing anyway, is called loopy belief propagation, and often it works fairly well. Just be aware of the fact that it can sometimes go horribly wrong. OK, so how do we fix it? Well, one way to fix it, and mind you, this graph has a running intersection property that's kind of nice, but it's a loop. Well, we have to cut somewhere, right? So let's go and cut it. Um, OK, so let's say we cut at 1. So what happens if we cut at 1? Well, we basically have to go and carry that variable x1 through all throughout the graph. So that's what happened here. And now the separator sets are, well, between here, it's just 1 and 4. And here it's, you know, 1 and 6, 1 and 8. 8 and 10, and so on and so on. So what you can see, and also the 1. Um, sorry, it's actually 1 and 10, sorry. So what you can see is that the 1 goes all the way through. This makes sure that we actually take care of the effect of the variable x1 throughout the entire graph. The nodes don't have to be, well, OK. So what I've basically done is I've added an extra, an extra set of edges, right? So I've basically triangulated the graph. So what, what I do is I, and actually finding an efficient junction tree is unfortunately MP hard. But what, I, what I've basically done is I've shown you an example of how to do this in this case. And there are stupid ways how you can make your life a horrible, mis horribly miserable pain. And, you can, and this is probably one of the more efficient ways. So basically what I've done is I've taken one variable and I've added fake arcs to everything else. So basically it just means I need to model and carry through the dependence of everything else on this variable. Because it really affects everything up to the end of the chain. And Well, these are clicks in the other, yes. So in the undirected graphs, we have an edge between any two dependent variables and no edges between two independent variables. Um, yeah, OK. So yeah, OK. So for, OK. So advanced preview for undirected graphical models, basically conditioning on a, on a set of variables means you rip those variables out and you look, at, look for graph connectivity. That's what conditional independence will mean in undirected graphical models. For this thing here, this is just purely operational on how to do dynamic programming. This doesn't have much of a statistical meaning yet. This is just to make sure that we don't end up with loops in the graph. And so what I do is I basically add a few more edges. And then now I get something that is a slightly fatter graph. So it's a, it's a junction graph that is slightly fatter, but it's now a tree. And when, I get, when I'm lucky, those operations may actually work. But the separator set gets larger. And I mean, this is not the only way how you could do it. So you could, for instance, you know, triangulate this way. And now you get you know, that kind of chain. 
this may actually be a better way of modeling things because it's quite plausible not to assume that x1 is this magical variable that affects everything until the end. So this will probably actually converge faster. And again, you have the same set of update equations. So that's exactly what we had before. We get the messages from that now are defined exactly on the separator set. So these are the variables that the two potentials have in common. You take all the corresponding incoming messages. You then sum out over the terms that we have before. And that's it. So we've gone from a very simple chain with basically three variables to something where we are now defining general operations that are sums and products on cliques and separator sets. The last thing that we'll need to do to generalize this even further is that we'll need to redefine what sums and products mean. And that covers essentially pretty much all that there is in dynamic programming, but I think I'm getting, going to get kicked out. So just as uh, an advanced preview, if you have stuff like this, you're basically stuck. Because you can't really do easily any dynamic programming there. You get, you know, this basic dense mesh. And so, well, forget about designing junction trees. Uh, for this, you need to approximate things. So there are, for instance, mean field approximations that deal with this in an appropriate way. We will get to this eventually, but for the moment, basically, think of this as something where the algorithms that I showed you so far fail. Okay. So what we'll do next Wednesday is the GDL, and then, well, we should be able to, uh, to wrap up graphical models probably early next week. Okay. Thanks for your patience today, and see you on Wednesday. Yeah. I, I just felt today's lecture is so rushed. So. Well, uh, I mean, the, the thing is I need to get through content. This is really the problem. I, I, honestly, I, I, don't, I don't get one thing once the trees start to show up. Mm. I'll probably figure out what the, what the L's and R's mm. are, a bit white, yeah. but then, then I got completely